Recall from nebular theory that planets form from the accretion of smaller bits of matter. In the case of our solar system, various forces have conspired to keep many such bits of matter from ever becoming part of a planet. We find these bits of matter concentrated in various regions. For the inner solar system, there is the asteroid belt, which lies primarily between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, but also within Jupiter's Lagrangian points. Recall from a previous lesson that a Lagrangian point is where the gravitational force of a planet is balanced by the gravitational force of the Sun. For the outer solar system, we have the Kuiper belt, which lies just beyond the orbit of Neptune, from about 30 to 50 AU from the Sun, where 1 AU, recall, is the distance between the Sun and Earth. Then there's the outer, outer solar system, extending to maybe 50,000 AU or much more. Within this distance lies the Oort cloud, which is a collection of some trillion or more objects just barely held by the Sun's gravitational pull. So we have the asteroid belt, the Kuiper belt, and the Oort cloud. Let's talk a little bit about each of these. First up, the asteroid belt. The term asteroid was coined by William Herschel, the same guy who discovered planet Uranus back in the 1800s. Aster means star, so asteroid literally means star-like. The largest asteroid is Ceres. It's the only one to be so nearly spherical, which is why it's sometimes also called a dwarf planet. But as shown here, even Ceres is much smaller than our moon. In fact, the combined mass of all the asteroids is still significantly less than that of our moon. The Dawn space probe is scheduled to enter orbit around Ceres in March 2015. So, if you're watching this lesson after that date, be sure to look online for the latest images. I do, however, have images of the second most massive asteroid to share with you. This is Vesta which the Dawn space probe visited first in 2012. That peak in the southern hemisphere is about twice the height of Mount Everest, even taller than Mount Olympus on Mars. But personally, I don't think this is a fair comparison, as Vesta itself is so small compared to a planet. The Dawn space probe was scheduled to visit both of these asteroids, not only because they're among the largest, but also because they're so significantly different. Ceres is of the carbonaceous type, which means it contains a fair amount of carbon. It also has minerals commonly used in fertilizer and likely a subterranean frozen ocean of water. Maybe the perfect place to set up a greenhouse, eh? Vesta is the stony type, which means it's basically a big rock of silicates and other minerals, but also high in metal content. Valuable metals too, such as nickel, cobalt, even gold and platinum. These stony type asteroids, or S-type as they're called, are most common within the inner reaches of the asteroid belt. Asteroids that come close to Earth tend to be of this type which has some people wondering about the possibility of mining these asteroids for their metal resources. Here's another S-type asteroid, Eros, which was the first to be visited by a space probe. That was the near Shoemaker probe in 2001. Impacts between asteroids send tinier bits hurling through space. These smaller pieces of asteroids are sometimes called meteoroids and they collide with the inner planets all the time, including Earth. Upon hitting our atmosphere, the heat of friction burns it up, creating a bright streak through the sky we call a meteor. A big one like the one that passed over this Russian town in 2013 is called a fireball. The meteoroid creating this fireball was estimated to be 17 to 20 meters in diameter traveling at 41,000 miles per hour. Most of it blew up high in the atmosphere. I know this streak looks like it's close to the ground, but it, it's actually some 70,000 feet high, twice the height of a commercial airliner. The incredibly fast speed only makes it look like it's much closer to the ground. 
The blast created a shock wave that broke many of the windows. How common is this occurrence? Hmm? Um, maybe once in a couple decades. Most go unnoticed over our oceans. It's estimated that a smaller meteor about the size of a car hits Earth several times a year. In general, smaller meteors are much more common. The big ones we have to wait for. Pieces of meteor that reach the ground are called meteorites. Every day, Earth receives about 200 tons of meteorites from outer space. Most, of course, fall into the oceans. But meteorites, which are burnt up fragments of asteroids, are of great scientific interest, as much as they are collector's items. Any bit of asteroid bigger than, say, 50 meters in diameter generally leaves a significant impact crater. Case in point is Meteor Crater in eastern Arizona, which was created about 50,000 years ago by the impact of a meteor about 50 meters in diameter. The bigger the meteor, the bigger the crater. The problem here on Earth is that the craters are often covered up by geological processes. Here's the largest known impact crater. It's in South Africa, about 300 kilometers in diameter and about 2 billion years old. More recent is the crater that is now Lake Manicouagan in Quebec, Canada. About 100 kilometers in diameter, it formed about 215 million years ago. It's now a primary headwater used by Hydro-Quebec to meet the electric power needs of this province as well as New England. Get the connection? People's electricity made possible by a meteor. Wow. You know what I'm going to talk about next, don't you? That's right. The Chicxulub Crater along the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula. Some 180 kilometers in diameter, it was formed by the collision of a body that was about 10 kilometers, meters? No, kilometers wide. Uh huh, the whole asteroid itself, or perhaps a comet. Its impact led to the extinction of about 75% of the living species, including the dinosaurs. Just think if it weren't for this impact, there might still be dinosaurs, and by extension, no humans. That's one big impact. On average, we get a 100-meter-wide meteor only once every 5,000 years. The big 1-kilometer-wide meteor comes only about once every 400,000 years. A meteor of the mass extinction sort only comes along about once every 100 million years. For this rarity, we can thank our dear big sister planet Jupiter, which in many ways acts like a vacuum cleaner, sucking up most of the errant flying bits of matter. This was made all too apparent to us when Comet Shoemaker-Levy collided with Jupiter in 1994, leaving these pocket marks that have since been absorbed. But some still get through. The latest big one was a mere 35 million years ago, resulting in the Chesapeake Bay. Not such a worldwide devastating event as with a Chicxulub, but enough to give us pause. So, what are we doing about this? We're mapping the paths of as many asteroids as we possibly can. Go to neo.jpl.nasa.gov to learn more. We're making progress, but you never know for sure the next big one could happen again at any time, but not likely. The question is, how likely must it be in order for us to take action? Something important to think about. Oh, and it might not be an asteroid. It could be a comet. Ah, comets. We'll talk about those in the next lesson. Good science to you. Mm -hmm.